I'm a minimalist, man. I cracked a beer for this because I'm like, I'm going to psychically kind of pretend I'm like at some like hotel bar at a comic festival or something. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. Cause it was funny. Like before COVID actually like, in November last year, I went to like a, a big festival, Lu you know, Luca. In, I want to go to that so bad. God. It was crazy. Like, it, I don't know, man. Like, it was a good experience, but like, it's all like, I don't know if it's up your alley. Like, it's all like Marvel and stuff, right? Is like, it? Yeah. Like, there's a, there's an indie part of it, but it's, de it's like, it's massive. And it's just like cosplay everywhere. And it's so crowded. And it's like those old, like, you, like, european streets that are really tight mm -hmm. and you're just like moving around and there's like toy axes hitting you in the face like my oh, glasses man. got knocked off and i'm like everyone stop <laughs> and it was just like i was kind of miserable and like at the end like i was glad to go and it was a good experience in retrospect but when i was there like and it rained the whole time so we were just wet i was there with like jack and simon hanselman they oh, were there cool. and like uh so like I hung out with them a lot, but we were all just like soaked all the time. Like oh, this yeah. is brutal. Like you couldn't get dry. And I was just like, after that, I was like, I'm not gonna go on another comics trip and for like at least like all of 2020. And then it just happened. And like I miss it so much now. Like I'd be back there <laughs> in a second if I could. Um, I wanted to go to Luca. I'm surprised to hear that. That's disappointing to hear that it's a superhero show. I, I pictured it as being like Angoulême. No, no, it's not like Angoulême. It's, I've never been to Angoulême, but I know oh. it, you know, like we all know it in our mm -hmm. scene, but it's, they, they have everything there though. So it's like, it's not even just superheroes. It's like, uh, yeah, like superhero movies and also like a lot of video game stuff too. It's just very sprawling and like, mm -hmm. I'm just like, where's everyone using the bathroom? They're like, just to find the toilet, you know, <laughs> like going and trying to get, like use the toilet in some like, some bakery or something. <laughs> like, it was, it was uh, yeah, it was stressful. It was stressful. And I have like a couple publishers in Italy. So I like, I had to table like the whole time, every, mm -hmm. like all day for like, I think it was like four or five days. So it was like big days. I was exhausted, man. I got, I like freaked out. There was, <laughs> there was this cartoonist beside me. I forget his name, but he was signing all his books in charcoal or graphite, like doing drawings. And he was taking that fixative, that really toxic yeah. spray indoors. And he was spraying it right beside me. And I freaked out at him. And I felt really bad after. They were all laughing like I was the biggest coward. Because you just happened to inhale it the entire day? You're yeah, well, I do. It gave me such a headache. He was just used to it, I guess. But they were all <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> well, it like coats your lungs on the inside. It's like yeah, but that's not supposed to be used outside. Like, yeah. you with a mask on. That's so weird because it's like another planet, right? Like you don't actually know what's your work is over there, but you don't know what's going on with it. No, I know totally. With and then getting like royalties and stuff from like foreign publishers. Impossible. Yeah, what are you gonna do? <laughs> you just take the advance money and then like you assume that's all you're gonna get. You know? Yeah, and you're just like, okay, cool. It's cool just to have it out, but like, and I know nobody's getting like rich off off my comic books or something, but you just gotta wonder, like, mm. yeah. Like like, can I see like a sales report or something? <laughs> yeah, totally. They're like a what? <laughs> we don't have those in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I've been watching some of your shows even before you asked me to be on here. It's cool that you're doing this. Oh, um, yeah. I watched, uh, I watched the one with Anders Nilsson because I, I really, like he was a big inspiration on me and I really like the one with like Nina that you had. Uh, oh yeah. Like, yeah. She's cool. great. Yeah. Because she's been railing about that a lot, just about like pain. But that's what reminded me is like getting paid in comics and like yeah, yeah. people seem that people seem to be talking about it more now. But it hasn't like it's just sort of like this thing that no one like talks about um, mm -hmm. how hard it is. Well, I talk to friends that do like children's books and stuff, picture books, and like the advances are like like 10 times higher than what you know. There's just like like royalties aren't anything, and a lot of other like in like all other publishing where there's like not like fiction or, or you know like prose and stuff and royalties are just sort of like icing on the cake where it's all about the the advance mm. uh, where it's kind of different with us i think i don't know and again like no one's getting rich and i wouldn't like knock any of the publishers because most of them seem really cool but uh mm. in my experience but i don't know <laughs> but it's also scary because what if you're like 
hey, I think you owe me money. And then they send you a sales report and then you see, <laughs> it just winds up hurting your feelings because you see the reality of- Right, like, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather just harbor, like I'm getting ripped off and be like, yeah. fucked up. <laughs> the truth is that like you owe them money for the printing of your book. Yeah. <laughs> How did you connect with that uh, Italian publisher called Hollow Press? Oh, Hollow Press, he, he contacted me. And, and they're a, a horror publisher, aren't they? Yeah, horror, yeah. That was the booth where the dude was spraying the fix it is. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Is he a horror art, uh, author, that guy? Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of charcoal and then fucking... <laughs> That's hilarious, man. I don't think they even noticed. It was all like smoking on filtered cigarettes all day. <laughs> so. I haven't talked to McKelly about it. He's, just, he's a really interesting character. Because I, I always like dealt with him... Uh, uh, through through email and then he came to TCAF the first time we met and like it was like set up night that Friday night and I was just dropping my books off and I saw this dude out front of the library and he was like smoking an unfiltered cigarette and he had like that Italian goth look to him I was like I bet you that's Michele and it was like I knew who he was in like the busy, busy streets of Toronto I'm like just from talking with him online like that's gotta yeah. be uh, but yeah, he's doing a good job with that stuff. He does like Matt Brinkman and a couple other like great books. I've been trying to stay away a little more like from like scrolling, you know, like mm -hmm. the way iPhones like tell you how long you've been on your phone. And oh, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, makes you reflect on, on your life. So yeah. I'm just kind of not to try to touch it as much. It, even when I post stuff, you know, I don't want to like keep looking. I don't feel like it's healthy. It's also like bad for my eyes, I think. Yeah, I feel this weird obligation to to feed these things. Like I'm like, oh, I haven't even posted any drawings on Instagram in like a week. Yeah. To post something on there. It's like, I don't, what can I put? It's like, you shouldn't feel like that. You should be like just creating work. And I know I, I was a little more like that. Oh, I didn't, I don't think I posted on Instagram like all summer. We, we left the city and went to like a cottage on the East coast all summer. So I was just on like the beach all summer. And I was just like in a completely different like mindset. I was so happy. Like I felt better. My body was like, just feeling good. Like I didn't feel sore or stiff and I was still working. I brought like my computer and all my gear and I was like getting stuff done, but, um, I didn't use the internet that much, you know? Like, so my body and my brain, like my spirit just sort of like, and then as soon as I came back here, I'm like, Oh fuck, I got to get out of this building. <laughs> yeah. What, how do you draw? Do you draw on paper? Or are you a computer guy now? I do both. I do both. You know, like I draw a lot, like in my sketchbooks and things like that. And this is kind of like how I, I would always work would be like, you know, I would just like doodle and like have like a lot of little things and like fuck around, and like not serious. And I'd be like, Oh, I like that guy. I like that. And I would like scan it in and bring it into like whatever grid I'm working on for the comic and kind of like blow it up and stuff. And then I would like, just create a composition more that way. And then I'd usually print it out and like light box that. So I kind of keep some of like the spontaneity of the original skit, like the, the looseness. But then sometimes like some comics, I'll just like with that last hollow press book, baby in the boneyard, like a lot of those were just kind of straight ink too. It just depends on the style. I think if I'm doing more like geometric stuff, I have to get like a grid and like kind of like start on the computer. It's like a back and forth thing kind of. How does the geometric style, how that evolve? Because I remember that your first book, even the Giants, was like more uh, like natural, like, you know, more hmm. rounded, I think. More organic, yeah. yeah. I don't know how, like, I just kind of like, I like, I, I, I just started, I don't know how I arrived at it, but I really like that contrast between that like wiggly, kind of like organic, like whatever formed like the universe like really enjoys like kind of like wavy lines and pulsing things and, and and then like when humans who are like made by that same thing interact with it and like terraform it like when you're flying in a plane and you like look down and you can see just like stuff that's not developed at all and it's all like mountains and like yeah. wavy trees but then when you get into like agriculture and it's all like grids and formed and then you get into cities and stuff and everything's straight like i i think like that kind of just looking at stuff like that kind of like just got me to arrive at that like style of like those two those two ways to kind of like build things are you when you're on a plane are you looking out the window the whole time the ground i used to when i was younger now i don't really give a shit you know sometimes sometimes i do but uh yeah i know i don't like flying that much I just get drunk and, and, and like watch movies and try to sleep, but you, I can't. Yeah, I can't sleep on planes. It's really difficult. And I can't read. <laughs> no, you can't. How come? 
You're too nervous? I just, hey, I'm too anxious. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to watch some dumb movies. It's like the worst movies ever on planes, too. So I'm just like watching some like romance movie. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they play old movies, man. Like sometimes you can find like they have a couple classics on there. I watched like On the Waterfront, I think the last time I was flying and like, mm. it, like yeah, some, some of them are, aren't so bad. Like I'm like, I'm surprised that's on there. Like tal- I watched Talented Mr. Ripley like oh. on the way to Italy like last November and I didn't yeah. really remember it was like about Italy or anything. It was like so perfect. Dude, I love that movie. It's a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. It just totally turns. This is a scene where... He- he smacks Jude Law in the face with the oar at the yeah. end, and he's like, and then Jude Law turns his like face all opened up. And he's like all blood and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's like from that point on, the movie is a horror movie. You know, like it's so it fucked is. Up. It, it's so psychological. I remember seeing it when I was a kid. I didn't remember it was a gay romance either. I saw it when I was a kid, like in the theaters, and I remembered nothing from it. It was like, like I didn't realize as a child that like that that Matt Damon's character was in love with with Jude Law, you know, like it was so lost on me and like watching it as an adult, I'm like, how did I not? Like the whole vibe of that movie had such a like John Cheever or like John Updike style, like those those old writers that would just like write about like rich kids that would like be in Europe and their dad would be like at home all the time. Yeah. No, it's great. I got, that's the kind of story that makes me want to like write something like that. Like I saw, there's this Woody Allen movie called Match Point. Did you it's ever see great, that? The tennis movie? Yeah. I love that, that movie. That movie inspired the, I wrote a book called uh, St. Cole. And that was oh, just. I haven't read that. I want to see so. It's like based on like, cause match point is like all about, he's the villain. You're following the villain. Yeah. Like he does all these horrible things, but then at the end he gets away with it by chance. Yeah. But he's haunted at the end. Yeah. Yeah. That. Well, you would be. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, because you know, he, he tries to throw the rings away that he stole from the old lady's apartment. Oh, the inspector finds it. And then, yeah, the inspector, some homeless guy had found one of the rings and, and had it when the inspector arrests him for something else, finds the ring on the homeless person, and then they connect him to the murder. To the murder, right, yeah. And I was like, ah, damn, that's great. Yeah. And I was like, I want to do something like that, where, like, the bad guy just gets away by chance, you know? Hey, did you go to art school? Yeah, I did, man, I did. Um, like, I grew up in sort of, like, a middle class, like, East Coast, like, life where the idea of going to post-secondary education, like, wouldn't even occur to me. You know, it was, like, beyond me. It was just something that you did. So, like, mm-hmm. you, know, you got to go to university. And I just, I just wanted to, like, smoke weed and, like, draw and stuff. And uh, so I went to art school, yeah. And, like, I was, like, kind of immature. It was sort of, like, a wa- it, I think it was sort of wasted on me because I could have got a lot more out of it. But... Mm-hmm. I think I learned about deadlines. Mostly. Did, did you know any other, were there any cartoonists in that, in school? That? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, a couple friends I'm still in touch with that, uh, that I did, that we did like an anthology comic called Lucky. It was funny, it was before we like, Gab, before Gabrielle Bell's comic Lucky, but we had this like anthology and we'd sell them at the art school. It was cool. We'd make some money off that too, especially at that age, you know, we, mm. it was fun. We had these big parties and, but it was, um, like really immature work, you know, like I'm so glad it was like, a, like not on the internet or anything. Are any of those people still working in comics? Uh, kind of like one of them that does, he's an electrician. He does the odd thing, but not really. And one of them, uh, Peter Diamond, he doesn't do comics, but he's like a very successful illustrator. He like moved to Vienna. He's been in Vienna for like, like over 10 years or something. Yeah. I think, I feel like you're a part of that scene. Like, Maybe it's just the Koyama Press thing, the connection between like you and DeForge and Patrick Kyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we also all live like in the same region and stuff too. Yeah. You guys ever see each other? Not anymore. You know, I'd see I'd see them at like comic events and art shows and stuff. You know, but not now. You know, like I'll send the odd like email now and again to both those guys about like more like. I don't know so if we have something like overlapping or something like Patrick is doing a, or he did a comic with like this Italian screen printer that I work with, you know, so we were talking about that, but we're never close. Yeah. I don't hang out with a lot of cartoonists, just like Mark I used to hang out with, but I don't, you know, it's funny. Like I like, I love art and like, hang, but I, I feel like I could never just hang out with all artists all the time, you know, mm-hmm. like, yeah, my girlfriend's like, she's a professor at the university and it's like completely different world than mine. So she's it's just like, but it's so refreshing sometimes where I'm just not like talking about, it's just like, 
com- a completely different but but it's like it's very righteous work you know she's doing like it's about poverty and like like tr- childhood trauma from like growing up in poverty stuff like this so yeah you know like i really respect it but we're working like completely different sides of the street and that's uh, so nice man. <laughs> yeah. yeah i wonder about these couples that are both like cartoonists or something you know like working that exact like exact. yeah did you used to read the, uh, superhero comics oh yeah absolutely yeah i grew up in a household full of that stuff did you yeah yeah uh I did. I was really into that. I was into like X Men. X Men was like a sort of like I had for a while. I was buying all you know, just a kid like spending so much money on my crap. And it was like, do you ever watch the uh, like Ed Pisker and Jim Rugs like cartoonist cafe? Yeah. Uh-huh. All those old wizards they talk about. That's like nostalgia for me because I oh, have those. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Like I, like I even remember some of the pages when I look at them. And I'm like, I'll screenshot it and send it to my brother. Like, remember this? He's like, holy fuck. You know, like sometimes I see it and it like opens up this part of my brain that hasn't been like, mm-hmm. just shines a spotlight that has not been like seen the light of day for like 20 years. I feel yeah. like a stroke or something. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do any work for them ever for Marvel or DC? No, no. <laughs> Have you? No, but I always wish that they still did that like bizarre tale or strange tales or whatever that thing was called where they had like indie cartoonists do stuff. Yeah, man, I'd love to. I was doing like some Swamp Thing drawings a lot, like little Swamp Thing comics and like posting them. And I was like, oh, it would be so fun to do something like that. But yeah. like what what uh, what Ed Pisker did for uh, X-Men, that was mm-hmm. really bad. Yeah. And DeForge did a, did he do Spider-Man or something? Yeah, but I don't think that was sanctioned. I think he just oh, okay. Did that. Yeah, I think I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he just drew that. But I, I had to get out of that stuff, you know, because it wasn't really, that was actually like looking at it now, like when I was into comics was when it was like at its shittiest almost, you know, like mm-hmm. it, it, it used to be better. And just the way they were, I remember like buying like all the, was it like Phalanx Covenant or something like some X-Men series and they all had like holographic uh, covers. Mm-hmm. I was spending like a lot of money on that stuff as a kid and I'd like obsess over it too. Mm-hmm. What happened to all those comics? I don't know, man. I got into drugs and <laughs> just like, didn't care about them anymore. You throw them away, I guess, or? <sighs> yeah, they probably throw it. Like my mom probably would have tossed them. Yeah. I don't think they're worth anything though. No, I know, but it's interesting to look through that stuff and be like, yeah, no, I'd love to have it back just for nostalgic reasons. But. Yeah, and you look in the the ads and it's like, oh, Cracker Jacks or whatever. <laughs> like the, yeah, the ads definitely get me, man. Like sometimes yeah. I read old comics, like I remember that from my youth. That's, that's, and like I feel like nostalgia can be like a problem when you get too obsessed with it, but I like it. I, I do like it, you know. Mm-hmm. Some people get too. Like you see these grown, like grown men, like just, you know. Dude, the video game world now, it's just like, Uh, it's not what it was man it's crazy now like the amount of money and just the way like the way people are like so demanding and stuff it's kind of like i remember when i was a kid video games was just like a toy you know it was just something you like played and then did your own thing or something but now it's like this whole lifestyle what was your experience doing that video game like it was all right like it was fine for a while it just took a long time you know like i started doing that game around the same time as like my book crawl space with koyama that's why they like look the same i was but now i'm just like so sick of that rainbow style i'm just like <laughs> i'm so glad it's done but i don't know like there's good and bad things it's just like i dealt with a lot of people you know like i like working alone like, you probably do too right Being yeah. there, and, like so many things were out of my hands that i couldn't really control and like it's sort of frustrating like I don't, kind of a nostalgic style game wasn't it yeah go i just tried to make it like it like what i think you know i, I feel like I grew up in a time when games looked a certain way and now they don't look that way. So maybe like younger people don't think that way, but I feel like when I make something, it's got like, even if I'm drawing like a little digit, like fixing up panels digitally or something, I don't want them to look digital on my comics, you know, Mm -hmm. I want them to look like drawings and like with the game, I didn't want it to look like a comic or like a cartoon or something. Yeah. But yeah, it was good. Like sometimes it felt like, like Barton Fink or something, you know, when he goes to Hollywood, you're just like, like it, it kind of like fucking ate me alive. Some parts of it, like super stressful. But I don't know anything about that world. But was that like an indie gaming company or something that reached out to you for that? I made it with some. I made it with some people I knew before. 
Um, so I was like working with them and then we got like a, I got us like funding from a Canadian granting company to make it. So we had like money that, so I was able to just like focus on it for a while. Um, but then we got like another company from LA to put it out on like Nintendo and stuff, you know, so there's all this like dealing with like marketing and stuff and all that stuff. And I was like, ah, that's probably not how I do it, but like, mm -hmm. what do I know? You know, like, how do they market it like in on just on gaming websites or something yeah and just getting involved in like um different festivals and stuff which were all online this year anyway mm -hmm. so it was just a lot of that a lot of interviews with like game like people you know like twitch is like this thing where they're like it's just like a youtube for like gamers i guess where like and everyone's obsessed with it like young people they just watch people play video games mm -hmm. and the person's just like making noises and like it's not really funny or anything but like my nephew like loves that stuff I'm like you like this eh? like the characters have like no personality like the hosts and stuff i'm like but it's really popular that's like what's huge man there's like so much money in that it's crazy tell me about you were a skater growing up i didn't know that yeah man big time i'm like i worked at a skateboard park for a couple summers like when i was in art school like an indoor park and i like oh. I've worked with a, a skateboard company on the East Coast that, like, I do, like, deck designs and stuff. Oh, yeah. man. Um, that's a coveted gig right there. It was fun. And this guy was, like, he he actually, he was the real deal. He was, like, his parents were hippies. He, like, built his own house. And he, like, had a bunch of Volkswagens that ran on, like, vegetable oil and stuff like that. Like, a lot of, this is, like, the early aughts. Mm -hmm. And he he had a wood shop and he'd harvest like all the wood he got was like from Nova Scotia. So it was all like local wood and he screen printed it all himself. And like, he was just like one of those really, really capable people that like a polymath almost, you know, he was a good artist too, but like I go there, he built a skateboard park. He, he had converted an old uh, fishing uh, fish processing plant. Like, so it was right on the water. It felt like you were on a boat. Oh, stuff. Wow. Really beautiful. Back when that area was so cheap, that's like near where, uh, conundrum like randy brown yeah is you know him like conundrum yeah yeah, yeah, I yeah. Did a video with him oh yeah yeah i saw that and he was talking about cheap real estate there so maybe it's still it's oh cheap. okay yeah he's in bridgewater it was like really close to there it's so nice up there man and like cheap and like yeah really if i could what what kind of uh like skater were you like what was your your company your brand of uh, boards that you liked when you were a skater Oh, I like Toy Machine a lot. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. same. I think the art, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. Really that Toy Machine it. was the, I was like so in on that. It was just like art and punk. It was just so fun. Yeah, yeah, it was fresh, man. I remember that, like in that Welcome to Hell, like I think it was their first video and, and, and Ed Templeton had like animated that like devil. And it was uh -huh. so cool. I look at it now, like that's, that. I'm surprised that impressed me so much. But it was just really like, man. Man. I started skating when Jump Off a Building came out, and I man, I've watched that so many. You're times. probably a little younger than me. How old? I am. I'm 36. Okay, yeah, I'm 39. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And I remember Jump, was... Jump Off the Building came out like when I worked in the in the skateboard park because we had like a video, we had like a VCR, and like there was all the skate videos there. So yeah, was, yeah, I was still yes. around. Now I don't do it. I'll still roll around, but like I'm not willing to like take a tumble now. Same man. I have a. I actually have a toy machine complete like in my closet. I'll, I'll go roll around in the neighborhood and stuff. I still I love it. And like I and I was telling my wife about this recently. Like when you skateboard after you're done, like when you like forever, you will look at the environment as like if it, is it skatable or not. Yeah, like, yeah. I still I still do that yeah and like i'll point out things like oh that ledge is perfect look at that and she's like well I'm like, look Dude, at that my ledge. instagram has more skaters on it than cartoonists i think like oh, I really? still, i'm still really into that stuff uh mm -hmm. and i wish i could more like i maybe i'll get a couple of wrist guards like i was going out to the like i like n near the end i was like more about like mini ramps and stuff because mm -hmm. it's not like i don't like skating street like i don't want to fall like a mini ramp i know how to fall on it and stuff yeah. so you know, I was like skating this concrete bowl, but I fell really bad and, and uh, I was just like, I'm not going to do that anymore. Just, oh man, we have a bunch of skate videos. I, I got really into like editing skate videos when I was yeah. a teenager. So like I still have all those and man, let me tell you, you cannot interest uh, your romantic partner in watching. <laughs> I'm like, check this out. This is a video I made when I was like fucking 18 years old. Check it out. Let's watch it. And she's like, I don't want to watch this. And I'm just like, look, that's my friend Jesse. Look at this guy. Like, <laughs> like she's like, 
Because we'd make like little skits, like we, you know, we were like, yeah, yeah, totally. Stuff. Yeah, it was all about that. We used to do that too, you know, you're the buddy with the camcorder, you yep. like go out and like watch me like ollie over this gap or something, but like it just looks like shit, you know, like there's no fish eye on there's it. There's no fish eye, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's true. Like, I thought it was all, I'm sure I ollied higher than that though. I'm trying to film them on my skateboard, do a line, and I'm just like, I, I'm only filming their feet. <laughs> It's like baggy pants, like flat. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but it was so fun, man. And then like you'd go and, and you'd film your friend, try to like do some trick. You'd be there for like an hour and a half. He's still doing the same thing over and over again. And then he's like, starts losing his temper. And the next thing you know, you're like filming him, like throwing his board around, like it was called like focusing. When you like, you just jump on your board and break it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. I remember, my neighbor, I always looked up to. He was a couple of years older when I was really young. Like, I got a new skateboard, and it wasn't a really expensive one. Like, it was kind of off brand or something. Like, it didn't come from the skateboard store. And I was just like so happy with it. I was like, "Look, Mike," and he was like, "Can I focus it?" <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, "Sure," because I didn't know what it meant. I thought it was a trick or something. He snapped it in half. Oh man! Thanks, dude. Ha <laughs> ha! You know, like I didn't want to like lose face. You know, like cool. <laughs> oh, dude, that sucks, man. Was it like a Walmart skateboard or something, or what? No, I think it. Like thinking about it now, I think I got it from someone else, like a friend's older brother or something. Yeah, you know, like that's Bob. how I got. That's how my sister Amanda was dating a skater in Arizona, and he he got he gave me a complete skateboard that was like it, it was probably stolen. It was like all beat up and everything and it had like all the corners were like rounded off like it, the tails have been dragged oh, so yeah, hard yeah. And stuff. you just get a giant fucking like cut on your leg if you yeah. <laughs> yeah, do a trick and it like goes in your groin and just like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the knife at the end of both ends of your skateboard <laughs> yeah yeah i like had it i remember i was i had like pride in it though like i spray painted it it was like i was like trying to like you know, uh, restore it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got like re I got like new grip tape on it at the skate shop. There's like I was like, can you put new grip on this? It's like some beat up old warp skateboard. <laughs> yeah, like sure, kid. <laughs> yeah. But that was it. Like that was so fun, man. Because they, you know, you go to the skate park and it's like really. Actually, you know what? This reminds me a lot of like the first time I ever went to SPX. It gave me a similar feeling as like the first time I ever went to like a skate park because oh, it's okay. like. I was in over my head, you know. Were you there as an artist or just a visitor? As an artist. Uh -huh. And I'm like sitting there tabling. I was tabling right next to John Vermilia. Is that the guy's name? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he had these like amazing screen prints and stuff. It was like incredible. And I was there with my mini comics. What I just found out. Just, it was all just self-published? Yeah, like self-published mini comics. And I just felt like, <laughs> God, like I'm in like a whole, I'm like, I should not be here. <laughs> it was scary. And I remember I was there and then I remember Kevin Heisinger came up to John and was like, Oh, I'm a big fan of your work and stuff. And I was like, God damn. Like I knew all these people from like the internet or from their work or whatever. So they were all kind of celebrities to me. And yeah. I'm just sitting there like, wow, maybe he's going to notice my mini comics here. You know, it's like, no. I walk by. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was your first mini comic? Do you remember going to the well shows and stuff? Oh, well, the art school stuff, I was like, I was, man, I was making like little comics in high school and stuff, oh, you know, okay. like scenes and, and things. So it was just always something I did. But then I did that, even the Giants with Ad House. And that was like my first like real, but I, I did like, I'd screen print covers. And so I used to work at a screen print shop. So I was able to like use all the equipment for free. So I'd make like cool, cool books that are like oh. so long out of print, you know, but it's just something I always kind of did. So but I only started going to those festivals like after like the ad like TCAP was my first one. It was when I had even the Giants. Like I hadn't even gone before. How did Ad House find out about you? Um, um, Hartley Lynn. Yeah, that's his real name. name. Real name. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, because I always knew him as like Ethan Riley, mm -hmm. and, and um, yeah, he showed him. But I remember I went to. Uh, there was like a big zine fair in Toronto every year. And when I first moved to Toronto or we moved to Ontario, I never lived in Toronto, but like outside of it. And uh, I was like, Oh, I should just go to this. And I set up and like, I had all these mini comics and they were cool ones, like all screen printed and stuff. And, and Chester Brown like came in and I'd like seen him give a talk on the East coast before I was like, Oh my God. And he bought, he bought one, a bunch of my stuff. And then he wrote me after and he was like, I want to buy like 10 of those to like give for Christmas presents. I was like, wow yeah so like it was like really kind of like 
I was on the East Coast, which is like completely separated from everything else. And it was like before the internet was like as big, you know, it wasn't like I was posting anything. Mm -hmm. It was like before social media. So then I went, but as soon as I moved to Ontario, I just like met people right away. Yeah. So you were like, um, what was like 1 million mouths? Was that like your... Um, yeah, yeah, that was like a mini comic I used to make too when I lived in Halifax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and there's so, a lot of that in even the drawings. That was just like all shit I did for like the local Halifax and like arts and culture newspaper and stuff. So even the Giants is a collection, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. then I had like one big story, and I kind of like peppered the little things throughout. Yeah. What do you consider like of, of all your work? Do you have like one that you consider like your major work? Major. not really probably like like crawl space or safari honeymoon like the the more the newer ones but like i like the stuff i'm working on now so much more you know it's kind of like are you like that like you, you, you like oh yeah i can't look at even fancy bukowski i can't look at it's just yeah. you know i don't know i always tell like young pe- people when they ask for like advice like how do you do it i'm like first off i'm like i'm struggling on and off like it's like peaks and valleys you know like sometimes yeah. you're okay with money and then other times you're like holy shit mm-hmm. and and uh I'm like, I always, like, I worked a job up until, like, I was, like, 33 or something, you know, and I was always tell people, just get, like, a shitty job where there's, like, no supervisor that you can just, like, work on your stuff and, like, read, and that's what I always did. I worked as, like, you know, I worked in a parking garage, you know, I worked, I I had so many jobs where just, like, no one was around, and Mm -hmm. I I just, like, smoke weed and, and, like, work on my, on my comics. Yeah. So I, I worked at Panera Bread forever. That was like, I, I just, know, yeah. I had a job at Panera Bread and I would go there and I, same, I, I think I quit when I was 30, 31. I think when I went to Vermont, I quit. And but that's I, not a job you could like, that's like, that seems to me like a job where it's like, you got time to lean, you got time to clean. It that's is, like, it was tough, man. But I, I, but I liked it because I worked with some really funny people and like, we just joked around all the time. It was like most God, we should have been fired for the horrible jokes we were making to each other. You know, it was terrible, but it was so good for that. And the, the pressure, because yeah. you know, you're just letting off steam. Because you're the people that I worked with are all like my age. We just felt like losers, and yeah. we were just dicking around the whole time. And then I would sit down on my break, and I would get a piece of receipt paper, and I would just write comics on the receipt paper. Like I, the first Fonty Bukowski book was like all written, like on my breaks at Panera Bread. Oh yeah. And that's why it feels like so like raw and funny to me because it's just like. We just like letting off steam from like this shit life, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like we we just hated it, but it but it was good. I, so I agree with you. Like you should have like just some crappy job that you're like not invested in at all. Yeah, yeah. And then go home and draw, and like you'll do like, the best. Throw the stress, yeah. So it's just like you're fresh, you know. And it's like I I, but people are also like really like I mean it's easy to say, but like if you're like locked into this job you hate, it it's like really risky to leave it, you know, because mm-hmm. you need money and. But like when you're younger, kind of like minimum wage jobs are a dime a dozen, like at least when I grew up. So I'm like, yeah. as soon as I didn't like a job, I just like quit it or just not even quit it, just leave, just not go anymore. Yeah. Bye. You know, I don't know anything to this fucker that like is underpaying me. Um, so I would just, you know, like leave and bounce around till I got a job that it was just like, oh, I don't have to do anything here. The thing is, like, with me, and, like, I'm not afraid to admit, like, so, so many cartoons, like, don't want to talk about, like, oh, I'm not, like, I just see people, like, acting like they're, like, making all this money from comics, and, like, they're not, like, overtly doing it, but it's almost like they're ashamed to be, like, hey, like, my parents own this house, and I'm just, like, living here kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, Jeanette is a professor, so I also have that safety net, like, where I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to be... In the streets. Out on the street, Yeah. yeah. You know, so it like allows me to take more chances and stuff. Mm-hmm. When I was working on the game, I was like offered like a job, like a full time animation job, and I was working part time on the show. Mm-hmm. And then I was just like, they wanted me to do full time, and I was like, no way, you know, I don't need it. But it was still, you know, it's like eleven hundred or twelve hundred US a week or something. Like now, it'd be like, yeah, where do I sign? Hell yeah! What was that? Didn't you do work on Adventure Time? A little bit, yeah. Not a whole lot. I'm not good at that kind of stuff, man. Like, it's what is that work like? Like, how do you? I was doing like character design and like special effects things, and like, it was just terrible. I remember like when I first started, like, I had to do these like mutant guys, and and uh, I was like the front and back view, and like I'm not I'm not a cons- consistent cartoonist, so it was like the front view had eight arms, and the back view only had six arms. <laughs> <laughs> 
who helped you get that job? Was that just like knowing the forage or something or what? That no, kind of- it was just, I think they were just like looking, maybe, maybe Annie Koyama, maybe a little bit, but they just like contacted. And then like Matt Forsyth, who I'm like good friends with, he was like the, uh, like art director there for like character oh. design mm-hmm. too. So I don't know. Maybe like, maybe a little nepotism or just like them looking around. Cause it seemed like they were really kind of like farming or not farming, but just kind of like foraging for cartoonists. What about, will you tell me about your trip to Tokyo, like a comics festival? Oh uh, yeah, that was fun. What was that festival called? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> my memory is like a hole in my head, man. Uh, I think it was like 2014. It was like the like Tokyo big site. It was at, oh my God, Chris Butcher's gonna kill me. But it was, uh, I, I can't remember right now. But when you're in Tokyo, like, well, first off, how long does it take to get there from where you are? I think it's like over 10 hours, maybe. I think maybe 12 <laughs> hours or something. See, yeah. fuck that. Uh, fuck that. <laughs> but the flight was like empty. On the way back, I had like all three seats to myself. And I was just oh, like, nice. I actually slept because I was exhausted. Was it inspiring at all to go there? Oh, totally, man. It's like... Uh, it's like, it's just like a completely different world from North America, you know? It's just like, it's very, I mean, all these like cliches are like Blade Runner and stuff, but like when you go through like, like Shibuya or something, it's like Times Square, but you're like, oh, this must be what like Times Square is going to look like in like 40 years or something. Like, oh, wow. the way it sounds. And, and like every, like, I don't know, man, the Japanese, they do like, I remember like, like I heard this history podcast, it was about World War II and the guy said, the Japanese are just like everybody else except more so, you know, and it was just like, like that, like all their food was better and like everything looked way better. Like the, just like the design of the city. Do you hear my little dog barking? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was incredible. I loved it. The food is just like, off the hook. but like I, I went with Chris Butcher and a bunch of like comic guys who are like really into manga and I'm not like, I like manga and anime, but I'm not like obsessed with it. And they just, they were going to like all the, the stops you know all the shops that are just like wall-to-wall manga everywhere i just like go like wander around during that time i'd look for like i'd look for like half an hour those guys would stay there for like hours oh really is it but um do they have like alternative comics there i think so it's hard to break into manga like i I, like it's so different man like i don't think like western comics do that well i I don't know a lot about it but i don't think western comics do that well in in japan because i remember like we brought a stack of my comics and they did sell and like butcher was like really surprised that they did Mm -hmm. he was like normally like the american comics don't really sell here because one they're like stylistically so different and two like they're just more expensive as well like manga's really cheap you know like, yeah, you get, like yeah. book for like nothing and, and they read them really quick i think too right yeah probably yeah so the pacing is a lot different like it you know you're supposed to like take one of your books and spend some time pouring over the illustrations yeah and, it, and then like they're just like <laughs> <laughs> reading it right <laughs> the, I think that like my favorite comic international comic festival I ever went to was Boom Fest in St. Petersburg in Russia. Really? Oh wow, that would be it's fun. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like it was. I think it was like my first one I went to even. So maybe that's it. But we had like a flat downtown. Like it was like right where like the re- like October Revolution took part too. So it was just like history everywhere. Like that communist like that Soviet beginning. And I was just like, oh my god! And all the people that were there, like from other countries like all the french people and stuff they were all communists and stuff too yeah. so just sort of like oh man this is like you don't get that you don't get that kind of like interaction at normal comic festivals it was like mm-hmm. political but not just like neoliberal politics it was just sort of like people that like knew what's up it was a really fun place yeah. are you is your work uh, translated into russian no i wish no no why were you there i don't know <laughs> uh, I, to, like, I stayed with like julie delport you know her oh, yeah uh-huh. yeah um i think it was through koyama press i i wonder how american authors do. i have a they published like two of the fonte Bukowski books in russia and then angolem the publisher was there and he, he kept me and i was like oh i was like it's nice to meet you how are my books doing he's like not well <laughs> who was it what publisher uh i don't know i, I don't i have to look at the at the date <laughs> of my I don't even know what they're called. Though. I don't feel so bad about forgetting the Japanese festival now. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 
but uh, it was, you know, and I remember Charles Forsman was like next to me when the guy said that and Charles Forsman just like started laughing really hard. He's like, ah, ha, ha, ha. 